Hey, I want to follow uh, Alvaro in, uh, in welcoming you all to this workshop. Um, I think it will be a very interesting workshop. Um, we'll go get into it immediately and start with our first speaker. So this morning, the first two speakers will be heavily focused on the material science. So the first speaker will be uh, Jack the Slipper from LBL. So Jack, if you can start sharing your screen. Uh, I, I just tried and it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. I, well, that's not something I have an access. Alvaro. So maybe Alvaro, could you, could you give me the permissions? Try, try again. Yeah, give me one second. Uh, mm, How about now? I can do that. Ah, now it's working. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, and uh, Jack is going to talk about materials, science, and chemistry at the exascale and challenges and opportunities. Jack, at about 20 ish minutes, so I'll uh, raise my hand so, or leave you a note in the chat so that you know where you're at on time. Okay, so does everything look okay? Yes. All right, well, let me tell you just uh, who, who I am real quick here. So I, I wear a few a few different hats that I think are kind of relevant to this uh, the program today. So uh, one, I'm the NERSC Applications Performance Group Lead, and I lead uh, what is called NESAP, the NERSC's kind of exascale readiness program. And uh, that's probably the hat I'm going to wear the most during the, the presentation, but I'm also the developer, one of the developers, I guess I should say, of the Berkeley GW project, um, which is funded by a BES software center um, called c 2 sepam And I'm also the kind of involved in the US uh, ECP project, the Exascale Computing Project, um, as the lead um, on the kind of management side for the material science and chemistry area. So you'll hear from a bunch of, I think, projects later in this program, uh, starting with Paul Kent right at, right after this, who's definitely uh, one of the one of the key players in the uh, material science area for the exascale computing computing project. Um, so as I said, I'm probably going to talk most about my role at at NERSC, but I'll touch on a little bit of the other two, particularly the Berkeley GW project. Um, and then you know some of the some of the ECP uh, lesson lessons learned as well. Um, so let me let me just talk about NERSC because I think NERSC is sort of one of the HPC facilities that's representative of what's kind of happening in the in the ecosystem as a as a whole. So NERSC is the mission. Did we all lose Jack? Yes, I, I cannot listen. Yes. Different projects. And interestingly, I think that that corresponds to nearly as many codes as, as projects. Um, and, you know, of course, one of the ways that we measure success is in like publications or scientific output. And so, so you can see that we're in the in the thousands of citations per year. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, the nurse kind of represents um, among the greater sort of computational science or HPC ecosystem is this transition towards energy efficient architectures um, in our in our systems. And so if you look at what's kind of happened over time with NERSC's seventh system here, which was named Edison, uh, this was a kind of tra traditional HPC system that uh, um, relied on sort of these server class multi-core CPUs um, distributed across many, many nodes um, to give uh, kind of significant parallel performance. But with the, with, with the delivery of Cori, I think we really started this transition towards energy efficient architectures. And so Cori um, got most of its performance from what are called many core CPUs or the Intel Knights Landing generation of CPUs that um, were kind of our first step towards towards exascale like architectures. And now with NERSC 9, uh, which is on the floor now, uh, named, named Perlmutter, um, 
we have a system for the first time at nurse that gets most of its performance from accelerators or from from uh, from GPUs and you know we're expecting to kind of uh, continue this transition with a you know first exasystem at NERSC in the in the 2025 time time frame um, and if you look at the DOE's uh, the Office of Sciences upcoming systems as a whole you see a you see a trend that um, nearly all of them are accelerator based I think as uh, Alvaro, uh, Alvaro kind of alluded to in the, in the introduction so with Perlmutter we have NVIDIA GPUs and with the upcoming si the exascale systems uh, Aurora at uh, ALCF will have Intel GPUs and uh, Frontier will have uh, at, at OLCF the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility will have AMD GPUs um, and I've kind of put in here the the kind of closest to the metal programming model that um, is typically used for each of these. So CUDA uh, on NVIDIA D GP GPUs, um, DPC++ or SICL on Intel GPUs, and HIP on, on AMD GPUs. And so this provides kind of an additional, an additional challenge, uh, perhaps also some opportunities when trying to target this ecosystem as a as a whole. Um, so if you look at like how Perlmutter looks, you see that um, each blade is powered by uh, four NVIDIA A100 Ampere generation GPUs and one CPU. Um, this is of course the, the, the phase one system with um, now 40 gigabytes of uh, HBM per GPU, so 160 total across the, um, across each each node and so you know one of the conclusions that I want to 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 draw here is that the vast majority of the of the you know performance on a node um, is coming from from the GPUs and so that you know if you want to use the node effectively uh, focusing on those GPUs is, is really important um, of course we do have some CPU nodes coming um, in, in the phase two system. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do with Perlmutter was optimize the system for science, not necessarily like Linpack or, or benchmarks. Um, and so we think that there will be some workloads that can use both of these nodes or can use, um, you know, the CPU nodes in particular most, most effectively. Um, as I mentioned, we kind of designed Perlmutter to be a system optimized for science, not not really for benchmarks. But it is nice to see that it landed um, in the uh, in the top five of the of the five five hundred the top five hundred uh, supercomputers. And interestingly, it is the um, most energy efficient system in terms of gigaflops per watt, watt of any of the any of the top ten systems. Um, and I think that shows you kind of the the value of the the GPU architectures for for one thing, as well as kind of the you know, there are some aspects of the uh, energy efficiency that come from just this computer being located in Berkeley, which has kind of a mild a mild climate as well. Um, so this is kind of what our our user community is facing as we continue this transition towards exascale. So here's uh, some of the the specs and and changes between Cori and and Perlmutter. So in particular, we're moving from this this uh, architecture that was centered on the Intel K and L processors towards um, architecture that is centered on accelerators with the NVIDIA the NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Um, and so as I think I mentioned earlier. You know, NERSC really has, I think, the most broad, diverse workload of any of the DOE, at least, HPC centers. Uh, we have lots of users who are already experts in GPU programming, but many users actually have little GPU experience. Um, and so I think at NERSC, we, we feel it's sort of our role um, as the HPC community moves towards exascale to make sure that the greater, you know, computational science community doesn't get left behind. And so we've created a program that I think can, uh, that, that I think sort of works well um, and maybe could be a model for 
um, well, as many ways model after what some other facilities are doing, but in other ways could be a model for how kind of a successful transition towards GPUs can can work. And so our strategy has been to partner with, um, you know, around 20, 25 applications, as well as the vendors to really port and optimize these key applications over to the over to Perlmutter and then kind of share the lessons learned with the nurse community via like a, a documentation hub and a number of training programs, which I'll talk a little bit about um, a little bit about later. So if we kind of talk about the resources that each one of these application teams gets and sort of really requires, I think, to be successful, um, we're really talking about uh, an application team that involves like a, a bunch of different uh, folks from different uh, organizations, as well as a, a you know pretty significant commitment of time. So, um, at you know for some of the some of the top teams, they're uh, given a postdoc uh, who's kind of dedicated to the project, plus you know around like 20 25 percent of a nurse staff person's time to help uh, facilitate the project. Um, Typically, there is um, a engineer at the vendor's site. So in this case, like NVIDIA and HPE Cray, who can um, spend time answering questions and looking at the code and analyzing um, some of the profiling data, for example, to, to help out. Um, it's really important that the team itself be committed, I think, having at least like one FTE of committed time, I think is really, um, really key to success. Um, and then I'll talk a bit, a bit about some of like the events that we, that we host or participate in to really help um, push, push projects along. Um, so, I'll, you know, I think we're um, a little bit short on time, so I might just kind of skip this slide, but I want to talk about, you know, real quickly here are, the kind of material science and chemistry applications that we've been that we've been working with. And I'll kind of tell the story of how some of these have turned out at the at the end. Um, one of the nice things about Perlmutter is that it sort of supports, I think, um, essentially every GPU programming model. So uh, a few minutes ago, I showed the slide about what. Um, what the primary sort of closest to the metal at least programming models are for Aurora and Frontier. And you see that even those two uh, will be supported on, on Perlmutter. You know, I think, I think what we realize is that there's, as I said, lots of codes that um, kind of already had GPU ports available, um, but there's, there's other codes that um, are just getting started. And I think we kind of can support the, the mix one of the things that I do want to highlight uh, in particular is that um, we really we really wanted to enable an open NP solution for Perlmutter. And it's probably the solution that we would recommend to somebody who's just getting started porting to, to the Perlmutter system. Um, and you know, the reason why is that during our last application readiness activity for uh, for Corey, we um, uh, you know, spent a lot of time um, working with users to improve their on-node parallelism, and that very often took the form of uh, using OpenMP to express sort of thread-level parallelism or uh, vector vector-level parallelism within OpenMP. And we think that that provides a you know using OpenMP to um, address and utilize the GPUs kind of provides a continuity for the for the users and um, allows them to kind of use what they developed for for Corey and just ex kind of extend it to the to the GPUs and so we partnered with Nvidia to make sure that um, openMP offloading was available within the in Nvidia I guess what used to be the PGI compiler compiler suite and so this is now in production. Um, and was released, uh, yeah, released back in, in production back in April, April 2021, and then continues to kind of improve in every release of the NVIDIA HPC compiler since then. Um, one of the things I wanted to advertise to this community is that um, 
I think that these hackathon events have really proven to be a highly effective tool for preparing apps for Perlmutter and other new architectures. Um, the public, uh, you know, we've had a couple of different types of hackathons, but the ones I really want to highlight here are these public GPU hackathons. If you go to the website, gpuhackathons.org, um, they're essentially open to anybody, any team around the country or really around the world to, um, to apply and, and, and attend. And I think that they're really, um, they, they've proven to be really successful. I think they're actually successful maybe more for like sociological reasons than, than any technical reasons. But I think uh, just taking people out of their kind of day job to focus on their codes with like kind of the right experts looking over their shoulder and the right uh, kind of um, environment uh, sort of being surrounded by other teams with similar ambitions, I think uh, just becomes kind of a really positive environment for people to to people to be extra productive. So, um, you know, one of the outcomes from this talk that I hope people take away is go to the site and, and look at it and look for opportunities to uh, to participate, um, both as a you know team members as well as you know potentially potentially mentors. Um, so. One of the questions that comes up with what we're trying to accomplish is how do we take what we've learned from, you know, the, the 20 or 25 or so teams that we work with at a pretty deep level um, and tra translate that to like the 7,000 applications um, that, are, that are using there's many, many of course in the material science and chemistry area. Um, <clears throat> and so we're kind of pushing forward in a number of different, different different areas. So one is around standardizing the programming models and languages so that, um, you know, users can count on what they've developed to, to have kind of legs behind it to last uh, more than, you know, a single postdoc or graduate student's tenure. Um, and that comes in the form of a kind of standardization. So what we'd like to see is things like, um, Cocos and you know different C++ implementations end up in the C++ standard. Um, we're also pushing, uh, as I mentioned, the development of, of OpenMP and and uh, parallelization within the the Fortran standard. Uh, one of the things that I think makes the material science and chemistry community particularly effective is that there's a community code codes that many people can re, can rely on. And so we've been working with these codes in particular to make sure that we support the kind of most optimized um, installation possible. Uh, and then we've been working a lot with vendor tools, um, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in just the next couple slides, as well as what I mentioned before about hackathons and training and documentation. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the tools. So, you know, I think what I've noticed over the past few years is, um, you know, when you're when you're communicating with kind of scientific productivity, and so, you know, we've been looking for simple ways to kind of frame the optimization or this porting question with these teams. And, you know, I think that natural, the, the following natural questions kind of come up, which is, you know, I feel like the, these folks need a sense of kind of absolute performance when optimizing applications. And so I, what I mean by absolute performance is, uh, is sort of performance measured against some sort of maximum or, or system characteristics. You know, I've seen lots of presentations. I've even given lots of presentations where um, the presenter says something like my code is like two times faster this year than it was um, than it was last year. And in some sense, that's, you know, it's nice that it's two times faster, but it doesn't give you a sense of, you know, where the code was to begin with or where it is, it, where it is now. Um, and so, you know, to translate this question, I think what, how do you know if your performance is good? Um, like in that situation, it could have been terrible to begin with and it's a little bit better now, or it could have been, you know, really great to begin with and is now amazing. Um, and it's hard to tell unless you know in an absolute sense how things are performing. Um, and, you know, 
people want to know why am I not getting kind of the performance advertised from the system? And maybe the more most important question is, how do I know when to stop? Like, when are you reaching diminishing returns? Um, and, you know, if you look at an, op, uh, an architecture like Perlmutter, there are many kind of potential optimization directions. There's um, you know, using the, 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 the GPUs and, um, you know, trying to optimize maybe like the, the warp utilization or should you optimize around memory bandwidth or is it like communication that's really limiting your performance or IO or something else. And I think, um, these are really important questions for guiding, guiding optimization optimization. And again, I think they help answer the question of, <laughs> you know, how do I know when to stop? How do I know when I'm uh, kind of getting a performance that's good enough for my purposes? Um, and so at NERSC, we've really used the roofline model um, to uh, to help frame this conversation with, with users. It's not something that... Um, you know, it tells you particularly more different information than you might get from using, uh, you know, various tools like Intel's VTune or NVIDIA's Insight. But I think it it's just the right level of kind of information that scientists can easily kind of wrap their heads around and kind of draws them in to, to look for more. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we worked with NVIDIA to uh, integrate this roofline performance model uh, directly within their uh, Insight uh, application so that you can now collect kind of all the required metrics and make these sort of performance plots automatically. Um, and, th and it kind of helps uh, guide our optimization strategy at NERSC. Uh, okay, so let me end here with just a few science examples. I think I'm almost out of time. I think I have three three minutes left. So we've been working with a number of material science and chemistry teams. Um, you know, one I, that I think is particularly interesting is Exafel, which is um, a, uh, a a collaboration with uh, the, the the folks at Slack and the LCLS. Um, to analyze uh, X-ray free electron laser um, data in, in nearly real time. And I think the promise here is that if you can combine um, sort of a HPC allocation with um, you know, beam time, then you can kind of have a really powerful combination that can not just kind of analyze data after the fact, but really use real-time data analysis to help make decisions kind of during the experiments. Um, and so in two years kind of working with us, this team has really developed a highly scalable GPU application um, and has been able to really reduce the runtime from, you know, an equivalent number of Edison nodes from like 12.3 hours to, to really just minutes on the, on the Perlmutter Promoter application, and I think the great, the great thing here is that it really does then have the the power to um, um, guide experiments in in real time. Um, so this is kind of more of that story, and I'll just skip that as as a matter of time. Um, another application that we work really closely with is Lamps. Um, so Lamps is a classical molecular dynamics code uh, with a focus on um, really materials modeling in, in comparison to some of the other MD applications. Uh, so this is a, a code that has leveraged Cocos, which is a C++ sort of point. And uh, what you can see is that this, what was kind of necessary here is to look at every kernel um, to kind of rewrite it and optimize them individually and um, you can kind of see the performance improving over time as they, they address kind of more and more of those more and more of those kernels. Um, I want to highlight a couple points here in, the, in this timeline, which is different hackathons that the team attended. And you can see that those are kind of near vertical improvements and <laughs> improvements in the in the speed. And, you know, this kind of all paid off in uh, record scale uh, MD calculations that were run over the course of the last year. Um, reaching sort of billion atom MD simulations with, um, you know, quantum mechanical accurate potential. So they are using, um, 
what are called these SNAP potentials, which are machine learning based uh, machine learning based potentials to reach that to reach that scale. Um, and here is a you know kind of a a, per a performance plot showing the the final scaling performance on both uh, Celine, which is an internal NVIDIA system, uh, Summit, which had the A or sorry that had the V100, the Volta GPUs, and Perlmutter, which has the current generation of GPUs. And so this gap here is showing you the value of the sort of newer A100 GPUs over the the previous generation V1 V100 GPUs. Um, okay, and then I'll end here with uh, one more example, Berkeley GW, um, which uh, you know is an application that's really near and dear to my heart. So um, you know, GW calculations, and I think you know, similar to what you'll hear from from Paul Kent, have uh, about QMC have typically been limited to kind of the tens of atoms or maybe hundreds of atoms uh, sort of cal calculations. Uh, but I think to really um, simulate the, a lot of properties of interest to energy applications, you really want to go to thousands of atoms or um, you know, electrons or you know, even ten, tens of thousands of, of electrons. And so one, one kind of example of a use case would be like qubit design um, that are uh, you know, related to potentially the use of defects in, in materials. Um, and so uh, this team has been working a lot on, on um, GPUization. So uh, most of the work here is, is done by a person named Mauro Del Ben, who actually is uh, a member of group uh, of, sorry, of Bert's team at, at CRD. But I think one of the really interesting results that they're able to demonstrate after porting to the GPUs is this improved energy efficiency. So this is a plot that has time on the y-axis, average power on the x-axis. So time times power is, is energy. Um, and so this is essentially a plot of energy to solution. Um, and you see here the comparison between Edison and runs on Summit, which is of course a GPU optimized system. And you can see the energy to solution is orders of magnitude uh, in, improved as you as you utilize the the GPUs effectively. Um, okay, so final few seconds here. So key takeaways, I think you know the best outcomes of preparing application for these exascale like architectures, I think, uh, require you to kind of get on GPU technology GPU uh, systems early and really work on that. And maybe I'll just highlight this last point that I think really a mix of both new methods and algorithms as well as HPC best practices are what ends up being successful. And that um, I really would encourage people to check out gpuhackathons.org and events all over the country, actually really all over the world that you can you can attend. Um, and I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Bert. Thank you, Jack. Are there any questions uh, that uh, have come up that you would like to ask? So either uh, through chat or you can also raise your hand and then unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And thank you, Jack, for uh, staying on time. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> so we're good. And Murat. Uh, hi, I just was wondering at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you were showing comparing the energy efficiencies of different systems. And you had this level one, level two, level three. I, I was just wondering what does it mean? Uh, let me let me let me see here. Uh, so I yeah, this is a good question. I stole this plot from um, like the, the top 500 machine. I think I think the level one, level two, level three refers to um, like some some class of the system. If I like, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to. So I guess I'd have to look again. Um, 
I think it's like I think it's somewhere it's something to do about like where the me- measurement is done, where the measurement is done exactly. <laughs> so sorry, I, since I stole the plot, I don't actually know the I don't actually know the answer, but I can I can I can figure it out and get back to you. If you look at the top five hundred website, I think this is where this plot came came okay. from. Okay, thank you. Oh, any other questions? Let's see, Alfredo asks, what are the other C++ frameworks that you mentioned beyond Cocos? Yeah, so good, good, good question. So there's, so Cocos is probably the most popular for now, like most popular performance portability layer um, for, for now, but there, there are others. Another, another one is like Raja, which is developed largely at Livermore National Labs. And it's sort of in the same spirit as Cocos, it's this idea of, writing your parallel code at a little bit higher level so that it could be performance portable across uh, different different architectures. Um, and, and, you know, I, to some extent, I think that DPC++, which stands for Data Parallel C++, uh, which is an extension of Sickle, uh, kind of counts as one of these C++ frameworks as well. Um, and this is probably something that Alvaro is very familiar with since this is sort of the model that Intel has been pushing towards um, uh, towards programming for the for the Aurora system. And you know, I think what we at NERSC would probably like to see most, uh, or what I would personally like to see most, is for uh, the you know for the community to kind of take the best of each of these and push them into the C++ standard um going going forward um so that there's something that the user community can be confident will have legs and will kind of work across all these different architectures so Volker, you have your hands up if you have a quick one uh i'm trying yeah, actually, to get it back on schedule so actually alvaro's question is is pretty interesting so maybe we should go to that okay that's fine by me too so i Alvaro asks, in your experience, are CUDA implementations always faster than open ACC? Yeah, um, I would say like if you're comparing CUDA to open ACC, open MP, I would say usually um, with maybe a couple ex- exceptions, I think uh, what, what you end up doing with CUDA uh, is, is kind of the best that you can do. And so you know, one of the ways that we've been thinking about OpenMP is uh, for applications that already maybe have a CUDA implementation is using CUDA as kind of the bar that you want to reach and just trying to get closer and closer and closer to that bar with something like, like OpenMP uh, or, or OpenACC. Um, you know, there are a few situations where we've had uh, OpenMP implementations be better than like a CUDA implementation. But it usually involves some kind of change in 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 algorithm. Um, so I would say that uh, yeah, the the answer is typically yes. Um, but open we've been finding that OpenMP applications can get very very close um, in in many cases, uh, but not um, um, yeah, but not um, typically not kind of starting off better. Okay, I think we are definitely at time. Okay. Um, let's. I will stop sharing. Jeff and-